All right, thank you, everyone. Um, I just wanted to take some time here, uh, for those of you who are interested, and share some information about a project that I've worked, been working on for about six years now, and that is teaching Haskell to children. So uh, this is my presentation on the why, the what, and the how of teaching Haskell to children using the Code World platform. So I'll tell you a little bit of background. I have some photos up here to accompany my story. And that is Code World started about six years ago when I lived next door to a public school teacher who after 20 years of her job woke up one morning and said, ah, this really isn't for me anymore. And so she left her job at the end of that school year, started a school in her living room. And so you see here a picture of my first Code World classroom, which looks remarkably like the living room of someone's house. Um, she had a background in English language, she had a background in social sciences, but she came to me and said, how do I make kids love math? And so that was my challenge for her school. And my first attempt was to do recreational math. So we did the Towers of Hanoi and we did the art gallery problem and the Josephus problem and map color theorems, things like that. We even set up a casino where the kids invented games of chance and invited their parents to play with Monopoly money. Um, so we did a bunch of cool things like that and we did it for a year. It was great. And then I thought to myself, I'm really out of material. You know, what do I do that's not just me sort of coming up with something new every week and bringing in there, but might get someone to have a sort of ongoing lasting relationship with ideas from mathematics. And that's where I came up with Code World. It wasn't called Code World at the time, but what I did was I took the Gloss Library by Ben Lipmeyer and I adapted it to run in a client server setting over the web. So I installed Haskell on a server. I had students write code using uh, Code Mirror on the client and their programs would be uploaded to my server. I would execute their arbitrary code on my web server. Um, and then I would uh, stream the res resulting stream, uh, frames back from the web server to their client. It worked fine only because I think I didn't tell anyone who was malicious enough. Um, then I moved to California, so I'm out here in the Bay Area now, and I ended up recreating Code World on top of a project by Lauta called GHCJS. Most of you probably heard of it. So this is a transpiler from Haskell to JavaScript. Solves all my problems of letting people run code that runs up, write code and run it on my server. Um, but here I've got some, some photos that really kind of capture the essence of the story, which is this, this photo in the top right is a girl named Sophia. She's a sixth grader celebrating on the first day of class, getting two circles in place to be the eyes for the face that she's making. Um, on the bottom right here, you've got uh, Crystal Lemire, who's a coworker of mine at Google, and she was volunteering with the class uh, last spring. And this is her with two of the students she was mentoring who are huge fans of soccer and were thrilled at being able to create an animation of a soccer ball going into a goal as their final project for that class. So why am I doing this? Well, there's sort of the, the official answer. Everyone in the Bay Area kind of knows why we should teach computer programming to children, right? And here's a survey by Gallup in coordination with Google that says like, oh, computer programming needs to be everywhere, and opportunities are limited, and schools are underestimating the demand, and we need to meet that demand somehow. And that's a great thought, and I certainly don't disagree with it. But the truth is a little bit more complicated. The truth is that teachers are not computer programmers. So a school doesn't have a really easy time of just bringing in a computer programming curriculum and saying, hey, someone teach this. The truth is that instructional minutes in schools are very valuable and they are measuring measuring instructional minutes, not instructional hours. Uh, so we're talking about minutes spent learning the things that these schools, these kids need to answer on standardized tests to keep the school rated highly and everything that they deal with on a regular basis. Their time is valuable. Students have plenty of activities to participate in. So even bringing an elective like this into a school might not even draw a bunch of kids. It might, it might not. And then finally, we have to justify, if I want to teach Haskell, why am I teaching Haskell? Why not Python? Why not Java? Java has the advantage of being the language used for the AP computer science test for high school students. So all of these are actually much harder questions. We can't just say rah, rah, computer science in schools. You have to sort of think about why it is that we want to do it this way. 
Here's my answer. I don't actually care about teaching computer programming. I care about teaching math. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I got started in this not as a way to get computer science into a school, but as a way to get more engaging math education into a school. Once we care about teaching math, computer programming is an excellent tool for learning math, and then also, Haskell is an ideal language for using computer programming to learn math. That's the one advantage Haskell has over most other programming languages out there in an educational setting, where the biggest advantage is just that Haskell is essentially math written down for a computer. So let's talk about teaching math. Well, math education has some interesting issues. Here we've got a couple of options for what you could, a student could do with their day. They could read a book, they could look at stars through a telescope, they could paint a picture, or they can do math problems. Now, what do you think they're gonna pick? Probably not doing the math problems. So we actually have a bit of a public relations problem in mathematics education. Now, the first question a teacher needs to be able to answer is, you know, hey, why should I care about learning this? Notice I didn't say, when am I ever gonna need this? Because that's the wrong question to be asking. The right question is, why should I want to learn this? And why should you want to learn history is a kind of obvious question. There are pirates and Vikings and samurai and the Wild West, right? Why should you want to learn reading? Well, there's Harry Potter, okay? Enough said there. So why should I want to learn anything? We, we have a good answer. You know, science has dinosaurs. We have good answers for everything except mathematics. And in mathematics, our answer is, well, if you focus and pay attention, then in 20 years' time, your paycheck will have different numbers on it. Okay. Well, what does that mean to a kid? So that's one problem. Now, I don't want to pretend that all mathematics education is just doing problems. We actually know a few things that work for mathematics. One of them is manipulatives, and this is actually a really important idea in math education. It says, instead of just drilling people on answering questions, give them concrete representations that they can hold in their hands, manipulate, try to snap together in different ways or arrange differently to understand the concept. And manipulatives are hugely successful in mathematics. There are quotes here saying that, uh, from uh, Sarah, Sarah Moore talking about how manipulatives are essential to a deeper understanding of mathematics. And they work just fine in elementary school, but then we start asking questions that are a little too complicated for math manipulatives to be able to answer. Now I can buy manipulatives that are designed to teach the FOIL rule for multiplying binomials, but they're not really the same thing. They are no longer these flexible, strong, powerful ideas that I can manipulate to solve a wide variety of different problems. You can think of this almost like an API design problem. I don't want to create a custom-built API for solving only one problem. I want to create strong abstractions that are flexible and can be combined together to solve all sorts of different problems. So that's manipulatives. Another thing that works is mathematical modeling. This is a big deal, primarily because it's, in some senses, the goal of learning mathematics is to be able to use it to investigate different phenomena. But also mathematical modeling in education helps students get more engaged and interested in mathematics. It helps open like different brain pathways and neural pathways in the brain uh, to just study not just how do I do a math problem in isolation, but how do I relate it to the rest of the world. And mathematical modeling is widely known and widely respected. The Common Core State Standards requires that every school you know, focus on mathematical modeling as a math learning pr principle. But it turns out that mathematical modeling is one of those things that starts to work around high school and is tricky to integrate before that because it requires a certain level of maturity to even know whether you're taking the right approach or not, or when something goes wrong, to know whether that means I need to go reevaluate my model, or does it mean I just did a problem, you know, made a mistake in some computation, something like that. It takes a bit of problem-solving ability and skills to be able to investigate mathematical modeling in the first place. So those are two things that do work in math education, but only in certain limited settings. So the question we have is, how do I take math education and teach math which is concrete and manipulable and tangible, relevant and useful, scalable, so that it can be done at some level of complexity even before 
college level, but also is creative and exploratory and can be used for self-expression. So that's a pretty big task. Um, the answer though is we can integrate computer programming. So on the top left there, you actually see an example of a picture drawn entirely by transformations of geometric shapes by a student in a code world class. So she put together sectors and circles and rectangles and polygons and made this interesting drawing of a parrot, a butterfly, um, some things like that. This is a student who took some simple mathematical abstractions and combined them together in very creative, very expressive ways, was thrilled by the answer and was able to do it entirely on her own because she was guided by a language where she could see partial results. She could just click that run button at every step along the way and see what was happening and correct for her own mistakes as she moved along. We can also take programming and do experimental things. We can model paths of objects. Students build significantly more complex mathematics in a programming class than they do in a math class. I have students who routinely write three, four, five hundred lines of mathematical expressions in a few hours or in a week. Um, just as part of one of many exercises that they do in these classes. That's something that no mathematics teacher would even dream of. Um, it's also collaborative and social. They work together. It's concrete and manipulable, not in the sense that you can hold it in your hands. So it's not quite a manipulative maybe, but you get to the point where you feel like, hey, this function, I know what this function is. I've done things with this function before. I've put these two functions together and composed them together and seen what happens when I set them side by side. There's a lot that this has in common with those manipulatives. And then it's also just fun and it's engaging and it makes students happy. So that's its own reward. Making kids happy is always better than making them sad. <laughs> so we should teach programming to support math education. This isn't a new idea. Lots of previous programs have tried to go this direction. Logo, you know, the turtle that we tell to turn and move around, was invented in the 60s and widely used through the 80s. Scratch is widely used today. It's a programming language with no syntax at all because programs are written by dragging around blocks that snap together. Um, GeoGebra, sort of on the other end of the scale, is a more mathematically oriented um, exploration environment, sort of built on graphing calculators um, taken to several powers higher. Code.org is pushing hour of code in every school across the country. And then the last program I'll, I'll shout out here, mostly because I think it's a great one, is uh, Bootstrap by Emmanuel Schamser. They actually teach scheme and they do it in low income uh, middle schools around the country and have these kids go through a 10 week program where they invent video games programming in a purely functional sense in the scheme programming language. So there's a lot out there, but I think it's all kind of missing something. What it's missing is sort of the difference between writing a story and doing a Mad Lib. Most of the programs that we have out there right now are built around this idea that we will give students an environment where the program that they want to write is mostly complete and they have to fill in a few blanks. You know, here, here's the Pythagorean theorem. I'll teach it to you and then I'll show you how to write an expression that plugs into this hole that says whether the, you know, the space alien has caught up with the astronaut or not. Okay, but everyone is writing that same program. Everyone leaves these classes with the same things. You know, we have these hour of code activities where everyone, everyone starts with the same environment with the same cartoon characters and the same dance moves and maybe they combine the dance moves differently to choreograph a different dance. But they haven't done any substantial meaningful choices. So one interesting step that we want to look at taking is how do we build an environment where students are not just going through the motions of doing some computer programming activities, but also you know, making meaningful choices of their own, doing things that are expressive and creative in a way that requires that they be able to decide to do something different than their classmates. So this goes back to uh, something that Seymour Patrick, who actually came up with the logo programming language, uh, said about this, and he said there's a sort of difference between the idea of easy fun and the idea of hard fun. Uh, and he said hard fun is where students 
don't find something easy. They actually find it frustrating and challenging, but then they laugh about it at the end. You know, and this is this should be our goal, right? We shouldn't make it our goal to have students who say, "Oh yeah, that was that was fun because it was easy. I didn't have to work too hard." Well, that means they didn't learn anything. We should make it our goal to have students who say, oh, that was hard, and it frustrated me, and sometimes I wanted to throw my computer across the room, but I'm so glad I did it. And I've actually had really good success in Code World with having students accomplish exactly that. Um, struggle, and then get through that struggle, and be happy with the result in the end. Okay, so that's why we should teach programming, but why should we teach Haskell? That was the, the second question. Why are we not just teaching Java or Python? Well, I mean, we're the, you know, Haskell hackathon. Of course we teach Haskell, right? Actually, that's, that's not a bad answer. I think teaching what you're excited about is its own reward and worthwhile in its own right. But if I want to con convince a school that they should devote their resources to letting me teach Haskell, then it's what I'm excited about sometimes isn't a good enough answer. So here's the real answer. It's what we call the imperative impedance mismatch. So everyone's heard of the object relational impedance mismatch, right? Um, there's another impedance mismatch I'll point to, which is that programming languages and mathematics use words like function, like variable, like expression, but they mean completely different things. So in Mathematics, a variable is just a name for a value. In imperative programming, it's this weird box that I can put one thing in and then I can take that out and put something else in there instead. And every time through this loop, I change what it means. This is not a concept that occurs anywhere in math. Functions is the big one. So in math, a function is just a relationship between inputs and outputs. But in imperative programming, a function is a sequence of steps to take, a sequence of actions, each of which mutate the world around you. There are functions with no parameters at all. What the heck does that even mean? There are functions that don't return parameters but cause words to appear on nearby computer screens. These are not functions we study in calculus. Uh, the equals sign means something different. One of the most common things I can write in a language, uh, imperative programming language is x equals x plus one. But wait, x never equals x plus one. So, what am I doing here? <laughs> and the model of evaluation. Mathematics is built on the idea of substitution as a model of evaluating expressions. If I know that two things are equal, I should be able to substitute one for the other without changing the meaning of an expression. We sometimes call this the Church-Rosser property in computer science. In mathematics, we sometimes call it common sense. But it breaks in imperative programming languages, where we are forced to consider our computer programs as being ordered effects mutating stateful scopes, rather than just the simple idea of replacing things with other expressions that mean the same thing. So that's the impedance mismatch, but we might ask ourselves, does it really matter? Does it make a difference in the end? Maybe it's okay to teach someone a language which is a little bit different, where functions mean something slightly different. So we need to make, make the case that this is, this is something that actually makes a difference. But that case has already been made by Marilyn Carson and Michael Ortman, who actually are not computer programmers, but did a, a comprehensive study at a large university of what predicted the success of freshmen in their calculus class. And they wrote that the concept of functions is central to this. And they're not the only people. There are many surveys out there of college professors that say, you know, what idea would you like your students to understand better coming into this class? And the universal answer is functions. If they just understood functions, I would be a happy person. Okay. But then the, more, the other interesting thing about their study is that they characterized what it is about functions that, that predicts success in calculus. And basically what they said was a declarative understanding of functions, not an imperative understanding of functions. They said, what predicts success in a freshman level calculus class is not thinking of a function as first add three, then multiply by two, then subtract one, but rather as a way of describing relationships between pairs of numbers with a sort of flow of information in the forward direction. They did not use the words declarative and imperative. They used the words action view versus process view. Uh, but they were, if you dig into their examples, they're saying, basically the same thing. 
the example they give is, if you consider two functions, the first function is the one that adds up the first n odd numbers. The second is the function that squares its input. What can you say about the relationship between these functions? And I'll save you a little bit of math here. The answer is that they actually do the same thing. Okay. But then they said, we looked at the difference between students who said, those are two different functions that do the same thing, and students who said, those are the same function. And they found out that students who said, those are the same function, are going to go on, on average, and do better in mathematics later on. But in imperative programming, those are clearly not the same function. So this does kind of matter. The other thing that matters is syntax. So I mentioned earlier Bootstrap by Emmanuel Schanzer, and I don't really want to harp on it because I think it's a great program. But one thing I will say is that the use of scheme is in some ways very unfortunate. In mathematics, I can write x plus 5. In scheme, I can write open parenthesis plus x5 plus parenthesis. That's a different language, a new language that students have to learn that they did not have to learn in order to succeed in their math classes. In JavaScript, I can write this function that's 2x minus 3, but I have to write function f of x open squiggly brace return. None of this, again, this is a new language. In Haskell, okay, I have to do a few things different. I have to use a double colon instead of a single colon because, I don't know, if I could go back in time and change one thing about Haskell, that would be the thing. Um, I, I have to, change, to write number instead of a fancy R because I can't type a fancy R on my keyboard. Okay, uh, I have to type an asterisk to multiply because math notation is ambiguous. But these are small changes in comparison with a completely different syntax. List comprehensions exist in very few languages. Haskell is one of them, and in Haskell they look the closest to set comprehensions in mathematics. And even piecewise functions, where we get the syntax a little bit different, the, me the essence of the syntax is almost the same as the meaning that, that it has in a mathematics context. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so the upshot of this is that everything else ends up teaching, okay, here's how you say this in math, here's how you say it to the computer. This is math, this is the computer. In code world, I can stand up there and with very few adaptations, I can say, hey, we're gonna write some math and the computer is going to understand us. And that makes a huge difference. Like that, that makes an immense difference because it means that instead of asking someone to learn concepts and essentially a new language at the same time, I'm able to say, hey, we're going to learn how to do cool things with the same concepts and the same language that you're already studying in your math classes. So that's the why. Okay. Now let me move on to the what. So I want to teach Haskell to students in public schools. So what do I do? Well, the first thing I did was I built an environment, and this has developed considerably over time. But let me tell you what it looks like now. Um, it looks about like this. So here I've got a, a web browser. Inside that web browser, I have Code Viewer so that I can write Haskell code directly in the web browser. Once I've written that code, I click the Run button. That code is shipped over to a server which runs GHCJS to build JavaScript, ships that JavaScript back to the web browser where it runs in an HTML canvas right there in the screen. Okay. There's zero installation, zero setup. It works on Chromebooks, it works on tablets. It works pretty much anywhere that you'd like to use it. So it ends up being basically perfect for schools. In schools, it's really important you don't have to install something because then, oh my goodness, how do you even, how do you even think about the process of having computers in a school setting with some custom software installed on them? Um, I don't think I would ever get a school to let me teach. Uh, so oh, I'll mention really quickly that there are two libraries that we can link this Haskell code against. One of them is called Code World Base. The other one is called Code World API. They are both options. I have made a bunch of simplifications to the Haskell Prelude for teaching middle school students, and those simplifications are in the Code World Base library. The Code World API library is an idiomatic Haskell library that can do all of the same things, that has all the same graphics APIs available to it, but doesn't do a lot of the simplified Prelude stuff that I did for Code World Base. 
Uh, so you might have mentioned some things like my numbers a couple slides ago were called number. Well, number is not, you know, not a normal Haskell type, but it is in my prelude. Uh, so there are some, some other changes we'll look at as well. But both of those libraries are available. So from a student's perspective, they want to know, well, how do I make graphics out of this thing? How do I put something on the screen? And we start that with the coordinate plane. Now, every computer programmer knows that on the coordinate plane, the point zero, zero is in the upper left, X grows to the right, and Y grows down, right? Except again, we're teaching mathematics, and every mathematician knows that the origin is the center of the coordinate plane, Y grows up, and X grows to the right. Also, every computer programmer knows that the coordinate plane is measured in pixels. Except that doesn't work out so well for teaching middle school students. If you ask them to do math with numbers like 632 and 412, then they just space out and they don't even try. So we can go back to the mathematical way of measuring distances in abstract units and we scale our coordinate plane in code world to range from negative 10 to 10 in both directions. These are numbers for which students already have number sets. They know what happens when you add six and three but they don't know what happens when you add 612 to 305. Okay. It has the secondary benefit though, that when they want more precision, oh, well now we get to introduce fractions and decimals. So that's something we wouldn't have gotten to do on a pixel oriented plane that we can do here. And then we provide them with a simple API. And the goal here every step of the way is going to be, what is the simplest abstraction that can accomplish what we want? The basic picture API comes from Gloss. So I don't know how many people have worked with Gloss. It's a really radically simple way of putting graphics on the screen, just based on the idea of a few primitive shapes, a few transformations, mostly actually similarity transformations that middle school students are already studying around the eighth grade, and then ways of combining shapes by overlaying them. So we get circles, rectangles, polygons, there are a few other primitive shapes like sectors and arcs. We get translation, rotation, and scaling, and then of course colors because everybody loves colors. And then two different ways of overlaying pictures. So we actually have an AND operator that lets me say, I want a drawing of astronaut and space. And it says, okay, I'm gonna put the astronaut here, the space there, and sort of squish the two top to bottom. <laughs> Notice that I said top to bottom and not bottom to top. That's a change that I deliberately made from the way Gloss works for the following reason. If you compose pictures bottom to top, students will end up thinking that that and means first draw this one, then draw that one, which is regressing back into this idea of thinking about everything imperatively. Okay? Because the painter's algorithm says, if I start with the, the stuff furthest back, and then I move forward to the stuff furthest on the front, and then the stuff on the front ends up in front. So I intentionally made the opposite choice. I said the stuff on the front comes first, the stuff on the back comes behind that, specifically to prevent them from thinking about, oh, I first draw this, then draw this, and instead think about this is an expression which denotes a picture in its own right. And that is an expression which denotes a picture, and here's an operation which overlays those two pictures. And with those simple primitives, students can build some pretty cool things. So here we've got a uh, haunted house that was programmed by an eighth grader named Leisha in Daly City, just about 20 minutes south of here. We have a girl in a hot air balloon. I, I actually wish I had the full animation for you because she, she goes up in the hot air balloon and then when she gets high enough, she puts on a space suit and goes up into space. It's pretty cool. Um, uh, the third one was an assignment where we asked students to animate their favorite scene from a book. So this is Gandalf fighting the Balrog. Uh, then we have some fractal images, some other just cool things that have uh, come out of various classes that I've taught. So all of these, though, are just simple combinations of those primitives, those transformations, and overlaying pictures one on top of the other. So now we have the ability to build pictures. Well, the simplest thing to do is to just describe a picture and I want a drawing of it. Well, in order to get a drawing of it, I need to define main. And uh-oh, now I have to define main to be IO of something. What is IO, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so what I do is I actually only have one IO type in the entire standard library and I give it a type alias program, a 
program is a thing that does something. There are no combinators for combining programs. So once you've got a program, the only thing you can do is assign main to equal that. Okay. There is no monadic bind in scope. In fact, there are no type classes at all. I'll talk about this a little bit later, but there are no type classes, so there can be no monads. Uh, there's just program. Program is an alias for the IO unit type. Okay. Once I've got that, then I give them this entry point say, that says drawing of, this turns a picture into a program. But of course they want things to move. So the next thing we give them is animation of, which turns a function from time to picture into a program. So it just samples this function 60 times a second or whatever the browser's preferred uh, animation frame rate is. It samples this function and draws the frames one after the other automatically. So these are the two simple entry points. And I actually teach an entire first semester with just these two. We're learning to compose expressions. We're learning to build geometric patterns out of list comprehensions and fractals out of recursive functions. So we have plenty that we can do with just drawings and animations. Okay. After we get a little bit of that done though, then we move on into simulations, which is the next step. Simulations are where we have state, but instead of mutable state, we have an abstract mathematical model of a stateful system. And it includes an initial state, a step function, which adjusts that state as time passes. So it's just a function from state and an amount of time that has passed to a new state. And then finally, a visualization function that turns that state into a picture. Using this, students learn to build physics simulations of bouncing balls and cause and effect chains like Rube Goldberg machines. Okay. And then we throw in a little bit of extra thing, which is, okay, we don't want the same initial state every time. We might want to do something with some randomness into in it. So we'll, sit, we'll we will give a source of randomness to this function initial, which builds the initial state. And the source of randomness is actually just, actually exactly like randomness is often modeled in mathematical problems. It is just an infinite list of random numbers. You can grab as many of them as you want. So it's not a, a random number generator seed or something like that. It's just, here is an infinite sequence of random numbers that you can use to, uh, to inform your state. Yes? Uh, how many of your students trouble understanding this? This idea of the simulation? Yeah, um, how many of them have trouble would be pretty much every single one. This is an idea that they struggle with. Um, but it's also a pretty interesting idea. I think it's an idea that's worth struggling with. One, this, is a, this is a continuous time dynamical system. This is a state machine. This is an idea that comes up in many different fields all over the place. Right? So yeah, everybody struggles with this, um, but then they get through it and they learn how to do things in this context. And then after we've given them simulations, then the step from there to video games is easy. No problem at all, because all we have to do is add one more fourth piece to this, which is, okay, here's a state and a user interface event that's happened, give me a new state. Okay, so, and a user interface event is, we, we try to simplify this as much as possible. So it's just a key press, a key release, mouse press, mouse release, or mouse movement. Uh, there's no, there are no UI controls or buttons or anything like that. You can figure, the, figure out the logic to those things by yourself if you like. So making a button is not too difficult, but um, we just, we just give you the physical UI events coming from the mouse and the keyboard. Right? And based on that, students write games. So this is a game called Jacob the Fish. The goal is you are the yellow fish. You are trying to eat purple fish and not be eaten by the orange fish. And also you have to dodge sushi because fish don't like sushi. <laughs> Um, I did not invent this game, which is kind of the point, right? This game was invented by one sixth grader and one seventh grader at the school in Colorado where I taught this program. They decided on all of the details. The sushi is there because one of the two kids is fanatical about sushi, and they came up with this idea entirely on their own. Uh, the same year, somebody else wrote an interesting game called Night Wizard Archer, which is a lot like rock, paper, scissors, except with knights, wizards, and archers. 
somebody else came up with a game where your goal was to save an old lady from various hazards by dragging things like helium balloons onto her wheelchair. So if you had to drag a helium balloon to get her to lift up in the air or a parachute so she could fall safely, things like that, and just to dodge articles or obstacles like this. So everyone came up with something new. And that's, I think, pretty fundamental to what we're doing is we'd like, them, we'd like students to be able to experiment and do creative things on their own, not follow a formula and come up with the same game as everyone else. Now, this is where things start to get a little bit cool. So I was at Hack Fee last October, and I talked to Joachim Briner. Um, and he had this idea, which I had had. I, I, I wanted to, to explore this a while ago, but he said, you know, I think I can take this, and I think we can make multiplayer networked games. Okay. Well, that's a lot harder than making uh, single-player games, right? So he hacked away at this, and indeed, he came up with a working system to create multiplayer networked games in Code World, and there are three changes to this type signature versus interactions. The first is that you pass it a number of players, so you can make games for any number of players. The second is that when a user interface event happens, the event handler gets a player number that generated this user interface event. And the third change is that when we draw the screen, the visualization function gets a player number that says which uh, which player we're drawing the screen for. Aside from that, this is identical to the interactions that we already created. The implementation of this, incidentally, was entirely non-trivial, and Joachim has submitted a paper to ICFP this year on how he did it. Um, but the interface, though, stays just as abstract and just as easy to understand as everything that came before. And I think that's just really cool. I think that, that really is the underlying philosophy behind everything that I'm doing is let's try to make things as cool as possible, but without trying to, without compromising on clean API design, without compromising on abstractions. And it might be that you can't build a program to sell on you know, Google Play or the iOS app store this way, uh, but you can get close enough that kids will get excited about it and they will learn how to build non-trivial things in terms of simple abstract techniques. I did make a few changes to the programming language. So the, the student programs are compiled with an unmodified version of GHCJS, but we do make a few changes. One of them is I hide the base package and expose this code world base package, which provides a very different standard library. Um, there are two ma major changes in the standard library, and they were both made for approximately the same reason. The first one is that there are no, that we've uncurried all of the functions. So if you are used to using partial application to use first class functions, this is going to be a pain in the butt for you. But the reason why we've done that is that it turns out if you uncurry functions, you can write function application exactly the same way you write it in mathematics. You can write f open parenthesis five comma two close parenthesis, and it works. Right. So again, we want to. Try to try as hard as we can to present the same language that these kids are already learning in their math classes, not teach them a new programming language. The second reason for those uncurried functions, by the way, is if you forget a parameter to a function, you really don't want them to get an error message about why they're trying to use some function type when they when they wanted a picture. You want them to get an error message saying, hey, I expected a picture, a number, a number, and I got a picture in one number. And that's exactly what happens when the function is uncurried. When the function is curried, forgetting a parameter generates weird error messages on the whole other side of the program. Uh, the same thing is true of type classes. I removed type classes primarily because I just wanted a simpler model and to avoid complexity. But it turns out type classes are also responsible for some of the worst, most egregious cases of horrible error messages in the Haskell programming language. So there are people working on solutions to this, but type classes matching at the wrong times moves errors away from the place where they occur to unrelated parts of the program that accidental, because accidental unification happened in ways you didn't expect. We enable a few uh, language extensions, but then the third important thing that we did 
was rewrite error messages. So you'll notice error messages is a big deal in everything that we're doing. So here's an error message. If I leave, put an extra comma uh, in the end of an expression from GHC, it tells me illegal tuple section, use dash x tuple sections. Now, it's possible that I meant to enable this language extension, or it's possible that I might have just typed an extra comma. So we have we actually take the error messages out of GHC and we rewrite them for Code World in a way that tries to at least get at the most likely thing that's actually going wrong from a student's perspective. We also take the references to program lines and columns and linkify them so I can click on that link and take the cursor straight to the location of the error message and some other things like that. So. And the final thing we do is we work really hard on tooling and just student user experience cases. So here at the top, you've got a section of the code world editor. And here someone is working on writing a function. First look at that top line. You'll notice that we've color coordinated the matching sets of parentheses. That's because one of the most common problems students have is matching up their parentheses, knowing which open parenthesis goes with which closed parenthesis and so on. So we took this step and we said, we're just gonna color coordinate them. We'll, we'll color each matching pair a different color. This is sometimes known as rainbow brackets. It's a really nice feature that I ended up implementing for a code mirror mode for this. We also have autocomplete. It turns out students are not really great at spelling. If you want them to write translucent and have it actually mean anything, <laughs> then you need to give them some way of doing it without typing the word out by itself. We also give them the ability to save their projects in the cloud. So this is important as well because most middle school students don't have dedicated computers for themselves. They have a cart of Chromebooks sitting in the back of the room and they grab one on the way in. So they need some way to save their projects, not just on their own machines. And then finally, we give them the easy way to share their projects by hash. So once they've run a program, they can send it to their friends by text messages, by email, they can share it with other people around them. This has turned out to be, it, it was initially just a, a decision I made because what the heck, it was easy. And it has turned out to be one of the most important decisions that I made. It gets, it gets kids really excited to be able to share their work with other people. And that's where we are today. But where we're going to be at the end of this next summer is still up in the air. So Code World is now funding two students for the Summer of Haskell program this summer. If you know people who are college students and might be work, interested in working on something related to this project, please let them know. They can get a living stipend over the summer in exchange for contributing to this open source project. Some of the things we might end up with at the end of the summer are exporting student games to run on iOS or Android devices or using Mozilla Together JS to have collaborative editing of the same source code in a sort of Google Docs style, or integrating Code World with third-party libraries so that it can be used not just for generic math education, but also in a, a physics class or a biology class. So last summer at TFPIE at the conference, it's a Trends in Functional Programming and Education, I met this guy named Scott Walk, who teaches a quantum mechanics class at his university by using computer simulations of quantum mechanics experiments. It turns out you can learn a lot of basic intuition about quantum mechanics by looking at these experiments where they pass beams through non-uniform electrical fields. And they split the beams and merge them together and look at the resulting intensities. The problem he ran into with this is that most textbooks will walk you through the sequence of these experiments, but then students want to say, hey, wait, what if, and then they can't try it because running one of these experiments costs a few million dollars. <laughs> so he said, well, what if I put together a Haskell library and I let them run these experiments? And he did that and he's had some success with it, but his problem lies in that he has to have every one of his students install Haskell and then run GHCI and interact with his library by writing Haskell expressions in a, in a REPL and getting text descriptions of the results. So what if instead he could load this into a special code world mode with his Haskell library available, have them be able to, to arrange these things on the screen and see pictures of the beams passing through these devices. So things like that would be really cool as well. I would like to see this go in a lot of interesting directions in the future. So that's what Code World is, and hopefully what it will be soon. 
Um, the next final question is, how do we make this work? And my story, as I told you, is back in 2011, I got involved with this school called LSV. I taught recreational math, and then I started this blog series chronicling my class called Haskell for Kids. Then I moved to California, and in California, I've taught in Daly City, I've taught in Mountain View, I've taught at two different schools in San Bruno. I've basically just been emailing schools and saying, hey, let me come teach Haskell in your school, and some of them <laughs> say yes. So, uh, but it's, it's actually kind of taking off. I've now taught probably about 75 or 80 kids. So I sat down and, and added it all up, and I think it, it comes up to about 75 or 80 kids who've been through a code work class in this area. Uh, in addition to my own usage, this has been used all over the place. It was used for freshman classes at the University of Pennsylvania and at Australian National University, teaching them Haskell programming. They did not use my modified base. They used the version that has the idiomatic Haskell base there. It's been used for nonprofit organizations like uh, Empoder is a local nonprofit. Catalyst was a, a, a sort of conference for middle school girls at Swarthmore College. Code Day was another activity to teach kids programming. Uh, Louisiana State University actually used this in a teacher education program to show them some of the possibilities of technology. So it's not just my classes, it's been used in a lot of other places as well. But there are 16 million middle school students in the United States and presumably more of them abroad, I haven't checked. But, um, so, how do we scale this to the point where we can reach more people than just a few, uh, a few people in, in one area? And the answer to that question is, well, we need some qualified teachers. We need good reference materials. Now, when it's just me teaching, it's, it's good enough for me to say, oh, yeah, if you, if you need some help on that, feel free to email me or something. But I'm not going to tell that to 16 million kids. Um, we need curriculum design and planning, something that a teacher can follow through without having lived and breathed this for six years of their life. And we need resources for students to get help. And I've tried a few things. I've actually worked with a lot of people. It turns out I, you know, I, I work for Google. I spend a lot of time working for Google, so I don't have a lot of time to do, do some of this by myself. But I have met people and I've paid people to do things like write a textbook using CodeWorld write lesson plans using Code World. You know, try to prepare some PowerPoint presentations students could, or teachers could use to teach this in their classes. And all of these processes follow the same basic sequence of events. First, I'm really optimistic and have this really great idea. Then I sort of get started on it and we get, go through all the nuts and bolts of making things work, work out. And then we show it to a teacher. And the teacher invariably says, uh, you know, this is great, but I still don't know how I get started using this. Or this is great, but it's just not enough. And then we end up sort of saying, okay, we need more help. So this has happened a, a couple of different times, but the good news is that we've learned a lot about what exactly is needed to make this succeed in the future. So this is my, my current plan. My current plan is pretty ambitious. Uh, we have started raising a budget to spend on developing Code World. So the New York Haskell Users Group is sort of acting as an umbrella organization for this. We've raised so far, I think, $60,000 to spend on developing course materials for Code World. We would like to build a complete video tutorial sequence uh, teaching Code World from beginning to end. We would like to build complete online reference materials. We would like to build workbooks and accompanying worksheets for teachers to use. And then we'd like to organize it all with suggestions for, for in-class activities, things like that, that fit alongside this curriculum. So we have a pretty ambitious plan here. Um, that's not enough though. It's not enough to just say, here's the strict informational material that you need to make this work. We also have to keep it fun and engaging and we have to develop a positive culture. So I'm also working with a comic artist in Spain, a guy named Christian Mira, to write a comic book about the process of learning to program as using the metaphor of some kids who find a robot and try to coax it through life. We came up with this idea because after some of these initial projects about the textbook and the lesson plans, we looked at it and said, okay, all the information is here, but all the fun and all the laughter and all the inside jokes that were in 
some of our past classes are just missing and this this seems boring and so we sort of racked our heads and said well okay how can we come up with something that captures that sort of fun side so we came up with this comic strip you'll notice the robot speaks entirely in uh, GHC error messages so <laughs> Yeah, that, that's intentional. The goal is to get kids familiar with that kind of language and with some of the ways that GHC phrases things in error messages so that they're not as lost when they come across this in, in a programming context. We also need abilities for students to ask questions. So we've started, we've, we've set up a, a sort of a, a first attempt at this using uh, all answered, which is like a stack overflow clone. It's not great. We need to make some improvements there, but we're making we're making an effort in that direction. And also, we we need to build better ways for students to share their work because sharing work turns out to be the biggest motivator of all. So the iOS and, and Android applications would be a wonderful step in that direction. Uh, sharing animations directly to YouTube would be an interesting thing. Uh, so we have some ideas there. We're working on it. If anyone wants to help, this is my short pitch at the end. If anyone wants to help, there's a few things you can do. One is any college students you know, let them know about Summer of Haskell and let them know that there are two slots for a Code World student to work on this. We would love to have some development done as part of Summer of Haskell. We have mentors available and we're really excited about this. As I mentioned earlier, the New York Haskell Users Group is acting as an umbrella organization for raising money to spend on curriculum development. There's also the GitHub project. Of course, this is all open source. The final thing you can do is do what I do. Just email all the schools around you and say, hey, I want to teach Haskell. And uh, I promise you, it's not as hard as it might, as it might first seem. So thank you for your time. And uh, feel free to ask me any questions. That, uh, that, that college professor you were talking about who was trying to use um, the words to use code world to teach quantum mechanics. Oh, that, that was, uh, it, he, he doesn't specifically want to use code world, but what he has done is he's built a, uh, a Haskell library called Learn Physics. It's on Hackage. Um, it has this language called Beamstack that lets you design experiments using beams of particles passing through magnetic fields and look at the resulting uh, uh, intensities of the beams after passing through splitters and mergers and things like that. Um, it was, I, I sort of, I, I was riff, sort of riffing off of that a little bit in the sense of, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could not only do this, but make it graphical, something that you could look at? Um, I did mention it to him at the conference and he seemed interested, but I don't think I would, I don't want to characterize him as wanting to make this happen in code world. It's. You know, that's something I think we both agree would be cool if it happened. Yeah. Uh, just how do you deploy the server for Code World? And does everyone use your server or do you help them deploy their own? Yeah, so everyone mostly uses my <laughs> server, yes. There are a few people, I think the Louisiana State University class uh, built and deployed their own server because they wanted to make some modifications to it. Uh, the server is open source and there are you know, scripts to install and build it and run it. I personally host my own copy of the server on Google Cloud. So it's just sitting on a virtual machine out there. Yeah. Yeah, I think it would be very difficult to teach you know, computation skills, long division, things like this that in this framework. Uh, so it's, it's, it doesn't cover 100% of the curriculum. If you look through like the common core state standards for mathematics, you find that this is relevant to about two thirds of them. The biggest areas that are missing are probably like those computational skills and also some of the data analysis stuff. You can imagine designing data analysis activities using Code World, but using Code World doesn't implicitly teach you data analysis skills. You want to see some projects? <laughs> okay. Let's see. Here's that astronaut animation we talked about. So here's the full animation that I took that screenshot from.
This is the student at a school in Mountain View. So I don't know which student. Do you know Brooklyn? I'm Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Um, this is a project from a student in Colorado who was supposed to animate a scene from a favorite book. Has anyone read this book, The Elfstones of Shannara? Okay, so this is this is a scene from that book. Uh, she's apparently has been chosen to turn into a tree and protect the elven people or something like that. Um, let's see. Oh, this is one of this is that game that I mentioned where the goal is to protect grandma from various obstacles by dragging things onto her wheelchair. So there she is, and I'll like, drag some healing balloons. Let's give her a parachute. The pillow makes her uh, fall. Oops. Oh, okay. The pillow makes her fall fast, but um, but not get hurt when she hits the ground because she lands on a pillow. What happens if you let grandma get hurt? Uh, she has a health bar at the top, so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, this this game is suddenly a little bit darker than I, uh, <laughs> Let's see. What else, what else do we have here? This is the full, uh, Moria. Oh, wait, here's one, here's one that you didn't see before. This is, this is actually one of my favorite op animations. It was done by two, two girls in this class in Mountain View named Ava and Grace. Is running kind of slowly. You can sort of see it. So they were they were very happy about that one. It's one of my favorite animations. Let's see. I can find another one that looks good. I'm trying to find student projects. This is uh this is the Lord of the Rings scene. So this is Gandalf fighting the Balrog. <laughs> Any more questions? Oh, yeah. Have you, I've noticed it's been a couple of years uh, since your first launch, right? Yes. No, I haven't. I'm always a little afraid to ask for too much student data. You know? um, so I haven't, I haven't but it, that's a good point. We should definitely do some research and try to get like consent forms and then like pre and post test algebraic reasoning skills or something. I'd love to do that. Yeah. So it depends on the school. Um, most schools in California, I've taught it as an after-school activity. The school in, in Colorado, I sort of lived next door to the person who ran the school, so I was able to just actually just make it a regular part of their school day. Though so even then, it was two days a week, so it wasn't an everyday thing. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, the, so if we track progress, we'll have to ask them that function distinguishment skill. Yeah. Could be. I haven't. I haven't looked into it. Yeah. You mentioned they struggle with doing parentheses in I have not spent time on text editing. I don't, I think most of the students who show up expecting to learn how to make their own stuff would probably uh, revolt and overthrow me, me as teacher of the class if I tried to make them spend a week on just text editing skills. So I mostly, I, 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 I haven't tried it. I, 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 I'm always, sorry? Yes, they are. It's, I think parentheses and spelling are the two big ones. <laughs> yeah. 
Anyone else? Yeah. intentional. There are a few things I didn't mention, like I have gone through my entire prelude and make, made sure that there are no functions that have a verb as their name. All functions are named as either adjectives or nouns, because functions, again, describe relationships. They don't do things. Um, I will say that you know, there's this sort of myth in the functional programming community that, oh, if we had all not been corrupted by those imperative languages, we would naturally think this way. I find it maybe partially true, but not entirely. Even with students who have never seen programming before, it's still a struggle to try to, I, I, mean, I, I try to actively lay traps for them so that they will not be able to fall into patterns of thinking of their programs as step-by-step uh, -step instructions. Because if they do go that way, it's amazing how much you can rationalize that that is an actual correct explanation of what's happening and then end up incredibly confused several steps down the road. Another thing is I don't teach if then else, I teach guards on function definitions. So it's it's an amazing, like, you know, I, I keep refining my list of things that that trap students into going down the wrong way of thinking about things and misunderstanding fundamental ideas. And they are remarkably persistent. So it is a never-ending battle. Um, even for students who don't have the imperative background in the first place. So I can't imagine you know, if you tried to come from having also learned Python at the same time. Yeah. Uh, do you teach um, data definitions and structuring? Where is that? We do, yes. We teach pattern matching and not, not until about three fourths of the way through the, the year long class. But Yes, after we get into simulations, then we do teach uh, algebraic data types for defining their own data structures and then pattern matching for destructuring lines. Yeah. So you mentioned about middle school kids. Why not high school? Yeah, good question. So why not elementary school? Why not high school? I feel like middle school is an ideal age because it's right in that interval between you know, being able to think more deeply about abstract ideas, which elementary school students can't, but not being too driven by app direct applications. Um, a lot of high school students, if they're going to learn computer programming, they're going to learn it through an AP computer science class, and then that's going to be taught in Java because that's what the AP test is given in, or something like that. So middle school, I have a lot more flexibility to say, like, I think this is the right language for pedagogical reasons without having someone to come back, come back and say, yes, but in reality, it's going to save these students $3,000 if they can score a five on APCS. Yeah. Is the curriculum open source? You said everything that I have for Code World is open source, but the curriculum is still very much under development. So there are definitely openly available files I would be happy to point you to, but I don't think I have anything that I consider done enough to say that it's released. So that is, that is a, a goal in the very near future. My goal is within six months to be able to have a different answer for you. Anything else? All right, thank you everyone for paying attention.